does and get into the, uh, the science and things like that. So Angie, why don't you uh, kick us off in terms of what the topic is tonight? All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to our Friday product overview. We're excited. We're going to change it up a little bit. And instead of talking about the products per se, we're going to talk about um, the quality process uh, that we expect when we are producing the products so that you understand uh, what we expect from our manufacturers, what we look for in manufacturers, um, and then also the process the ingredients go through when we before we produce the products to ensure that you guys have safe and efficacious products um, when you're taking any of the Actis products. So David, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you kick this off. Well, thanks. Well, the first um, thing to, to talk about is, is an acronym that maybe some of you haven't heard about before. That's called GMP. GMP stands for Good Manufacturing Practices. And um, when, I'm gonna put my lawyer's hat on just a second. When uh, the dietary supplement, uh, it, was, it, was, it was called the Dietary Supplement Health and Safety Act of, uh, or DSHEA, um, was, was first created back in 1994 up in that point, there weren't really any, uh, there wasn't such thing as a dietary supplement. Everything was either a food or a drug. And, you know, foods and drugs have very different manufacturing practices and different standards. And so initially, um, sub supplements were, were supposed to meet at least the standards of the food industry. Well, that's not really a very high standard. If you go into a restaurant, if any of you have worked in restaurants or things like that, you, you actually, some of us, you know, ignorance is bliss. We don't really want to know the standards that they either adhere to or don't adhere to. <laughs> it's good that we have a good, a good, strong immune system. But um, finally, it took the FDA, I want to say, I want to say 15 years, something like that. I have to go back and double check to actually put GMPs specifically apl applicable to dietary supplements in place. But they finally did. And they finally also got around to certifying um, various facilities, manufacturing facilities, to uh, to make sure they're complying with these with these GMPs, and um, so most of this all revolves around paperwork, keeping track of things. But we want to get into that a little bit. So we have some guiding principles when it comes to our products. You know, all of you know that number one is efficacy. We've got to have products that actually have been proven to work. All right, and so they're all uh, cutting edge, scientifically validated products, and so. We obviously we work with like Pathways Biosciences and Test Track Medical, but you know you can have a formula that a scientist uh, created and has proven to work in both labs and clinical studies. But then you've got to replicate that, and if it's not made exactly the way they they produced it and formulated it in order to make uh, you know you can't necessarily assume that the benefits are going to accrue to everyone. And so we 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 have a very um, distinct and thorough process. That we put the products through. So let's first make sure, you know, talk about um, how, let's take genomics, for example. Um, I'll turn some time over to Angie to talk about how we make sure that what pathways formulated is replicated in every bottle that we produce and send out. Yeah, thank you, David. So uh, everyone knows with genomics, we have three main active ingredients, which is the rosemary, the ginger, and the Sephora japonica or luteolin. So those are the three main ingredients. What people don't realize is that there are certain levels um, and certain markers in each of those ingredients to ensure that we have the highest level of NERF2 activation um, when we combine those ingredients together. So it's not just a combination of um, the amount of those in three, three ingredients combined, but it's also, it's actually the markers within those three ingredients that we are looking for. So a lot of people think ginger, rosemary, and um, luteolin or Sephora japonica, uh, we could just take any, any old ginger, any old rosemary, any old luteolin and throw them together and get NERF2 activation. Um, that's actually not correct. So uh, what Pathways has done is they have found um, the specific markers in ginger um, and rosemary and luteolin. They have found how much of that active ingredient we need um, and the combination of those three to get the most um, potent NERF2 activator on the market. So what we look for is anytime we source ingredients, we ask for a C of A, which is a certificate of analysis. This is coming from the ingredient supplier. And what it does is it ensures us that we are getting the ingredient that we're sourcing, but it also ensures that we're hitting those markers for each ingredient. But we don't stop there. We, we don't wanna just trust the supplier that they're going to provide us what, with what we're asking for. We want to ensure 
sure that we are providing you guys quality product. So we take every, um, every lot of genomics. So anytime it goes through and we produce it with the manufacturer, that's considered a lot. So every lot of genomics, we source the ingredients. Once we, before we even source the ingredients, we go to the supplier and we get, uh, we get the ingredients and we send it to Pathways Bioscience. For those of you that aren't aware, um, Dr. McCord is, uh, is part of Pathways Bioscience. So there are the formulators of genomics. So we, we take the ingredients and we send it to Pathways Bioscience. They test it to ensure that it's going to hit those markers exactly. Um, once we have tested it with Pathways Bioscience, then we also test it ourselves um, before we take it through the manufacturing process. Once it goes through the manufacturing process, we test the final pro product one more time, just to make sure that we are still hitting the markers even after the ingredients have gone through the manufacturing process. So we're not testing the ingredients just once, we're not testing it twice, we're actually testing it three different times to ensure we're hitting those markers um, to make sure we have the highest level of nerve 2 activation. So that's one example of our quality process that we have when manufacturing products. And so, and genomics is interesting. Uh, actually, all three of the trifecta fall into this because um, as Angie said, we will order, you know, let's say ginger and ginger has to have a certain level of ginger sols or this, this phytonutrient that's within ginger at a certain potency level. So we can order all that and they can, you know, we, we tell them to test it with H HPLC testing to make sure it really is ginger. Then they do a potency test to make sure it really hits the potency level. But then you say, well, what is it that Pathways is Pathway Bioscience is testing? They're not doing the same type of testing. What they're actually doing is testing that those materials actually um, still uh, exert the same genetic influence over genes. Okay, so they're doing testing that the regular labs don't do um, to ensure the efficacy of it. And then, as, as Angie said, then we, then we continue the testing process uh, down the road. So that's, that all pertains to efficacy. And when it comes to link and OptiMend, we do the same thing. Um, and because unlike with Pathways, Pathways doesn't actually provide us with materials, they simply test it. With TestRack, they actually provide us with the butyric acid. They provide us with the tetrahydrocurcumin that has been, that has been uh, put through their Psylocke system to make sure, because you know, we, can order, we can order tetrahydrocurcumin, which is a curcuminoid or a phytonutrient of turmeric or curcumin. Um, we could order that from a very large international um, uh, ingredient company called Sabinsa, um, but then it would not have been put through the process. And, uh, and remember the, you know, we, we just did actually did a video with a group that we're uh, a group of Indian physicians that we're looking at doing business with. And um, they all talk about how um, every Indian family where someone starts getting a, a cold or a sore throat, every Indian mother will say, go drink some turmeric tea, go put some turmeric in milk and drink that. And then, and then one of the doctors is even saying how, how popular turmeric milkshakes are in the UK right now, okay? All that's great, but you know what? It's not gonna have nearly the, the efficacy of, of, of our tetrahydrocurcumin that's put through the Psylocke system so our body can actually use it. So that's the efficacy side. Now let's talk about the safety. You might say, well, what do you, what do you think you have to worry about? Well, there's actually a lot of things you have to worry about, okay? Um, you're, that we wanna make sure that everything that we say is in the product is really in it. We also wanna make sure that things that we don't want in it are not in it. <laughs> so what are those? What are some of those things that we wanna make sure are, are not in the products, Angie? So as far as safety goes, we're testing for um, micros, we're testing for um, any... Uh, let me, let oh. me interrupt. Does everybody yeah. know what micros are? Go microbiologicals, mold, bacteria, those type of things, okay? They have to be tested through special, you know, micrological testing, but go ahead. Yeah, and we're also testing for um, pesticides. So we're making sure that the ingredients, um, they don't have, uh, they're within the, the safe level of having um, uh, any pesticides. So, so some companies, some people, some uh, raw ingredient sources, they will use pesticides in order to make sure that their crops um, are safe and that they're not destroyed from, of course, insects and pesticides. So they will use some pesticides, but they, they go through a cleaning process of those ingredients and we test to make sure that 
there is no to very uh, little pesticides within the products. So there's a, a safe amount that is considered and the ingredients go through testing. All of the ingredients, not just the active ingredients, but we do the excipients, uh, we do the actives um, and anything that is put within the product goes through testings for the micros and the pesticides. Uh, we also test for E. coli, sal salmonella. Uh, we test for, I'm trying to think what are the other ones are, that we test for? Heavy metals, we test heavy for heavy metals. Metal. Yes. And then right. other foreign, other just other foreign things that might somehow end up um, in 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 a batch. And so we make sure that that all of that is tested for it. And then and we follow the same process, right, Angie? We 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 put our standards out there as to what the standards are they have to hit. But we we trust we trust our suppliers. But then we verify and we verify through uh, independent third party testing. And, and how many times do we do that? So the, the ingredients are actually tested uh, again three times. So the supplier tests the products. It comes on, as we mentioned, the certificate of analysis. So the suppliers will test the ingredients to ensure that what they're sending us meets their standards and also meets our standards. We'll look at the C of A, making sure that it does meet our standards. But like David said, we don't trust them completely. We wanna make sure that we are providing safe products. So then we will test the ingredients again um, for all of the micros, the heavy metals, salmonella, E. coli, um, so on and so forth. So the ingredients are tested before they're put into the capsulation product. And then once the product is produced, we go through testing again to ensure that there was no contamination when we go through the manufacturing. So we're doing three levels of testing on all the ingredients when it comes to safety. Now, one thing that's important to recognize, you may have seen, you know, in one bottle of a particular product, you might say, hmm, the color looks a little different in this one to me. Why would that be? Well, it's because in many cases, we're using plant source materials and, and plants, uh, depending on the climate, the water, the time of year it's harvested, where it's, where it's harvested can have slight color variations at times. And, and so the, the good thing to remember is that despite that, we still make sure that, that despite any type of slight color variation, they're still meeting the markers, the scientific markers that we've, that we've uh, set forth so that you can make sure that every single capsule that you take has been validated and, um, and, and made sure that it's going to, to, to meet the standards that we've set. Um, the same thing's true of we make slight variations between countries. For example, in the US, our capsules are all veggie caps, um, but in Mexico, they're bovine caps. And, um, and, and that's because in Mexico, uh, used, bovine capsules or gelatin capsules used to be the standard really everywhere. And then there became, and veggie caps were actually brittle and, and you know they were really hard to deal with from a manufacturing standpoint. It's come a long way since then. And in the US in particular, there's been much more of a demand for, for the veggie cap and, um, and in Mexico, not nearly as much. Now that may change and if there is, we'll change it. Um, there's actually some, frankly, there's actually some, unless people are vegan, there are actually some real good benefits from the gelatin cap. They actually serve to help um, uh, increase your, um, your joint uh, fluid as well, and can, you know, I'm not saying you have to, you should go out and just eat a bunch of bovine gelatin capsules, but but th there are some particular health benefits. Um, I did that, and and um, it made me a lot stronger. That is the primary cause of losing my hair, but that's a totally different story. Uh, Jill, you, Gil, you probably did that too. I'm I'm guessing at one point or another. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, those are the and so there are slight variations. And on that note, we also use different manufacturers. Um, we, but before we choose, well, actually, before I get go down that route, Angie, how do we go about selecting? Um, why do, first, number one, why do we use different manufacturers? And then how do we go about selecting those manufacturers? Yeah, so we, we use different manufacturers for a couple different reasons. One, uh, we, we manufacture the US improved products in the US and we manufacture uh, Mexico, Mexico products in Mexico. So right there, we're using different manufacturers for the same products. Um, the reason that we're doing this is, is a couple different things. Uh, one, we wanna make sure that we uh, receive the best pricing available so that we can offer our distributors the best pricing on the products. Uh, we also have a different manufacturer so that we have redundancy. As the company grows, we wanna ensure that we can keep up with our manufacturing needs and, and never run out of product for the distributors. So we'll have redundant manufacturers, um, but before we uh, select a manufacturer, we make sure that uh, they hit all of the certifications that we're looking for. So David talked about uh, GMP. 
Uh, there's other certifications that the manufacturers need to, to have and show us that they have completed before we'll even go and visit them. Once they have proven that they can meet our standards with their certifications, we'll do a tour of the manufacturing facility. We'll see um, how clean they are. We'll see um, their manufacturing process. Uh, we'll have them go through their, their quality assurance uh, department and their quality assurance processes with us because uh, we want to make sure that they're not just um, selling us goods on a piece of paper with showing us certifications. We want to see it in person. So every manufacturer that we've selected, we have gone and we visited in person to make sure that they're meeting those standards. So I mentioned that really the vast majority of good manufacturing practices, yes, you have the actual uh, there are things at the physical plant where they want to make sure that there's proper and clean airflow, clean water, and, and clear separation between different activities and that type of stuff. But then there's also really an important paperwork requirement. And what, I, what I re I'm referring to there is like when you look at every bottle and you find there's a lock code on that. And that lock code is for tracking purposes. Uh, with every batch that's, that's manufactured, no matter where the manufacturer is, they retain certain samples, a, a certain amount of samples of that batch. So if someone ever says, wait a minute, we don't think this worked, or we found something in our product or, or something like that, we can say, send it to us, let's, let's ship that. We can track that and we can show you at every step of the way, this is what happened here, this is what happened here, and this is what happened here. And that's not only to protect you, it's actually to protect us because there are people out there that are trying to make life difficult for companies by, by fraudulently claiming that something was in the product or something when it, when it really wasn't. Or if there was, in the, in the off chance that there was, there was something found, we wanna say, okay, was that an isolated instance or is this pervasive throughout the whole batch? And so that's why, uh, so it's really quite an extensive process that that Angie and her team make sure that the, our manufacturers all comply with. So um, now you are are all up to date on uh, <laughs> uh, GMP. There will be a test later on, and uh, we'll we'll make sure that all of you can can do that. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that even though um, good companies, we're not alone in this. Every good company out there should follow these type of of GMPs. Um, the fact that they that they should doesn't mean that they do. You've all heard of stories of you know products being taken off the shelves of GNC and found that they don't test out, they don't meet the potency. Um, quite, and I, I don't mean to call GNC out GNCs out uh, specifically, but they they have had some pretty celebrated uh, instances where that occurred. And um, and 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 so there's there have been problems even with companies that. Um, that, that appear to have really great reputations. We, we just don't rely upon our reputation or the reputation of our manufacturer. We make sure that we test uh, everything that we do. And that's true, I think also, because we're not selling a commodity product. Remember, when it comes to butyric acid, you know, why are we different? Well, because the Psylocke system, we've got the, this way to make butyric acid. We, I mentioned that we were just talking to this Indian physician and, and ghee is a rich source of a butyric acid naturally, and it's commonly used in Indian food. And uh, but you know, no matter how much ghee you consume, and most people aren't going to be eating a lot of ghee every day, it's really hard to maintain that that optimal level of butyric acid that your body really needs. And then the one aspect that we really don't talk about in terms of the uniqueness of the formula, yeah, we talk a lot about the technology and how it protects butyric acid and makes covers up the smell and the taste and gets it through the GI tract. But we often don't talk about the other ingredients, those other, those other prebiotics, the deglycerized licorice, the glucomannan, the inulin, that, that, that those are all fibers, really food for the healthy bacteria in our colon that will, will actually make this and, can, and, and help keep our body at an optimal level also. Similarly, on the, on the, on the optimum side, um, you know, as I was talking to this Indian physician, he says, man, we eat so much turmeric. Why do we need to eat more turmeric? And he said, well, because you, you know, no matter how much you eat, you're not getting as much as your body could benefit from. And so we're just putting this in a, in a way that will actually help benefit you the most. And so um, it really is a two-pronged approach, these guiding principles I mentioned to begin with. Efficacy, I, was, I would probably add another one, uniqueness. And then number three, the, the, the quality. Quality over everything. Um, and we don't make any shortcuts anywhere along the line. So um, Angie, anything you wanna add in closing before we ask if anybody has any questions? 
No, I think we covered it. So at this time, we're going to open it up and you guys are welcome to ask us questions. It can be on the, um, the quality process. It can be on the products. Uh, but we just wanted to have a little Q&A with you guys since uh, you joined us on a Friday night. Going one. Yeah. Going. <laughs> there you go. Um, I've heard um, one of the people I know he was mentioning his daughter has, um, um, she doesn't make collagen. So is there something that might help that? Well, I have a response, but I'll let Angie go first. She's pretty much, Angie's an expert on collagen, I think. But <laughs> go ahead. Angie. Uh, so uh, when we talk about collagen, uh, as we get older, we, we stop producing collagen, which we know is what causes the fine lines and wrinkles in our face because it, the collagen is what makes our skin plump. And so if, uh, as we start losing the collagen, our skin starts not being as plump. So we get those fine lines and wrinkles, mainly in our forehead, near our eyes. Uh, the Amora products, uh, they do have ingredients within them that help produce uh, collagen. And then a link also helps with, um, improving the, the microbiome in the gut and, and has a significant um, tie to the health of your skin. So it also helps with the collagen production. Um, but if, if we're talking about collagen production within your skin, uh, the serum is phenomenal with collagen production, but the toner will also help as well. So the ingredients within the serum are gonna be the um, ceramides and peptides. They're great for collagen production, um, but we also have like niacinamide that's good for collagen production. Um, and those are, those are the three main ingredients in the serum that are going to really target collagen production. Okay, you now this is to the point where her skin will break. You know, she falls down, then, you know, her knee breaks open. Well, I was, going to, I was going to say that um, I'm not sure that, um, I mean, we're talking, that's, that's a kind of a therapeutic um, amount there um, because collagen, obviously we talk a lot about collagen in regards, in regards to appearance and beauty and things like that, but collagen inside the body is used for a lot more than that, right? It's a, it's a cushioning agent and all that kind of stuff in our knees and everything. And what's interesting is in the very early days when we were like what, what Angie was talking about, we're, we said, man, I wonder if there's any tie. We knew that, we knew that as Angie said, that when you, when you um, improve the, the microbiome, that your skin looks better and feels better. But I remember asking Dr. Earl, I said, man, do you know anything about whether butyric acid or, or link, we can tie that into skincare? And he just started laughing and looking at me like, I thought you were smart. You didn't know this already. And I'm like, what? He goes, no, butyric acid is very important in the body's production of collagen. Um, and and uh, so I would, you know, again, what level she needs and that type of thing, but I would definitely urge her to take, to take more link um, because I think that will be helpful for her. Very good, thank you. Sure. So Pauline had a question. Um, she has a customer that claims that she um, had really bad gut pain from using the trifecta. So she's wondering what could be the reason and, and how can she provide some direction? Angie? So <laughs> Colleen, um, what I would say is uh, when you first start taking link, there can be kind of a cleansing effect uh, when taking the link supplement. Um, so some people can uh, have an upset stomach. Um, also, depending on when she's taking the supplements, pe some people are more susceptible to how supplements affect them within their gut. Um, some need to take food before they um, take the supplements and, and not take it on an empty stomach. Other people can handle taking supplements on an empty stomach. So uh, I would say our supplements not, don't necessarily need to be taken with food, but, we, but everyone is different. So someone could be more sensitive when they're taking supplements um, that it could affect their gut. But definitely um, if, if she's taking link, what she could do is instead of taking it twice a day, she could try taking it once a day um, to try to slow down that cleansing effect. Or if she just wants to power through it, uh, usually the cleansing effect have, uh, lasts about uh, three days if it's going to affect someone. So uh, if she's willing to power through it, I would say have her to keep going and just give it, give it three to five days and then see how she feels. I actually think Angie, if I remember correctly, isn't there a video where Dr. Earl says that, that same thing? Uh, I'm not sure if it's in the back office, but, but he talks a little bit about that as well. So um, that's, that's good advice. I had a question. 
with an autistic uh, young adult, um, they, the basic products that he needs to take is Optimum and Link. Uh, I asked a question because with the genomas, he was kind of having a headache. So, and he's very sensitive. So Optimum and Link and how many per day and how long the parent we will notice a change five, four weeks, seven weeks, or we don't know. Depends how, uh, what is the level of autism in the child? Yeah, um, and with autism, so we have talked to our formulator. So the, the most important uh, product of the trifecta will be link with that. And what they said is it's important for them to make sure that they are they have that level of butyric acid within the microbiome or within the gut um, throughout the day. So they recommended if, if someone is on the autistic spectrum that they take it not just twice a day, but they, that they take it uh, morning, noon, and night so that you have that consistent level throughout the day of the butyric acid. Um, David, I don't know if you want to add anything. Well, um, I would just add that you might, you might ask, well, okay, we understand the, the gut brain connection and that there, there has been, you know, studies that have indicated the connection between neurological disorders, whether it be autism or whatever, and the gut. Um, but, you know, also there's actually great science out there and you could just Google, you know, oxidative stress and, and autism. And you'll find studies that have shown that, that, that those who have oxidative, that those who have autism or other Parkinson's, Alzheimer's are also, their brains are subject to a lot more oxidative stress for some reason. And so that trifecta really is, and I, I would anticipate will continue to be effective um, for people who have those type of conditions um, because there are basically, there are basic, you know, I guess I would call them biomechanical or biochemical principles upon which that would be based upon. Now, again, we'll never say that it will take, it will totally, you know, uh, ameliorate or, or cure it. But, um, but what we can say is that to the extent that there's a, there's a, there's, there's a, a factor from the gut or a factor from oxidative stress, we, we can deal with those factors. And then we think that by dealing with those factors, it will have a benefit upon the condition itself. Then one more, you mentioned about the FDA. Um, so we are not approved by the FDA because we are supplements, right? So we don't have that. No, no, that's, uh, that's like very, I'm glad you brought, brought that up. Um, the lawyer in me <laughs> is a little sensitive to that issue because one of the criticisms of this industry, right, is always, oh, the FDA doesn't, doesn't regulate supplements. That's, that's entirely false, okay? Mm -hmm. They just regulate it differently. So the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, regulates food, it regulates drugs, and it regulates dietary supplements. But, but just like, um, and so, you know, when you, when you go to the grocery store and buy something, that's under the regulation of the FDA. And that store and the manufacturer, they all have to comply with regulations that the FDA, as well as the state, um, ha will put in place. And so um, the difference is, the real, the real key difference is, is that drugs require pre-market approval. Before they can sell the drug, the FDA has to approve it. But they don't do that with they don't do that with foods, right? I mean, if if you see something and and, a, and McDonald's is coming out with a new sandwich, they don't have to get it approved by the FDA first. Uh, they just have to make sure that it's manufactured and made in accordance with the regulations. And the same thing's true of supplements. It doesn't require pre-market approval. Now, I'll, I'll say that even though that's true in the United States, it's not true everywhere else. So in Mexico, we had to have pre-market approval. It had to be re reviewed by. Um, uh, <laughs> I always forget in, in Peru, it's in, in Vima or whatever. And, and you have each country has their own version of the FDA. Um, and, and actually largely throughout Latin America, there is a pre-market approval process, but the United States, as long as you are complying with the regulations that are set forth, then you are considered okay to sell. And, and so from that standpoint, we are regulated by the FDA just differently than drugs are. Does that make and sense? 
And so, one point on that, that the manufacturers are um, held to FDA standards. So not only do we make sure that we're following the FDA standards or FDA guidelines, but the manufacturers, uh, they are audited by the FDA. So they, they won't produce a product that doesn't meet the FDA guidelines. So if we were to go and say, manufacturer X, we want you to produce this product of this ingredient that's not allowed in the US, the manufacturer would not be able to, to produce that ingredient or sorry, produce that product because the ingredient's not allowed. So, so we're, we're not the only ones that are looking at the FDA guidelines. The manufacturers in the US select also look at the FDA guidelines as well. You know, the best example that, that we can show people who will say, well, you guys, you know, the FDA doesn't ha have any authority over you. That's why this industry is so bad, yada, yada. You can just point on a bottle. You can't really see it. But you'll notice on every single bo bottle of, of, of products that we put out, it has a little box. And in that box, it says, these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. I've had people who have said, oh, they have to put that on there because... Um, because they know that their products aren't proven and they and they aren't they, they they don't do anything. Well, it's just actually just the opposite. They're right about one thing. We have to put it on there. That's a regulation. Every single supplement in the United States has to have this on there <laughs> by law, and it's a it's an FDA regulation, and it has to have these exact same words on it. And if they don't, then they are not in compliance with the law. So I'm sorry. I just got on my little my little lawyer, you know. Um, box there for a second but um oh, that but was pretty when, good thank you but, but people you know it just drives me crazy when people say it's not regulated by the fda yes they are we totally are and and we uh, we abide by all the regulations in fact frankly we exceed the regulations we go above and beyond the regulations so anybody else is there anything else in the chat i'm not very good at keeping track of the chat uh aaron did ask why does optimum work so well I think because of the special sauce, um, mostly, you know, it's got special ingredients. No, just, <laughs> it really, it really boils down to the fact that um, turmeric cur curcumin is is really powerful. It has a powerful effect upon inflammatory cytokines, and actually, it uses some of the same pathways to fight inflammation that genomics does. Um, and so there's a there's a nice overlap there. But the reason, but the true reason that it works so well is because that that Psylocke delivery system, really forcing every molecule of tetrahydrocurcumin into another molecule. I mean, that's really hard to understand, isn't it? Really hard to wrap my brain around the fact that we're, we're forcing one little teeny molecule into another little teeny molecule, <laughs> and it's still gonna be a very teeny molecule when it's done. But at the end of the day, it's now wrapped in a way that um, you know, protects it. And actually the, the coating itself actually makes it more easily absorbed and makes it so it can get through um, the little micro exits in our gut, and so it can be metabolized in the small intestine and then spread from there out throughout the body where it needs to work. And um, and other and and other molly, other products. Basically, what happens is they get stuck. They're too big. They can't get through the exit. So they have to wait until they're broken down more by the stomach acids. Well, that's fine. It will reduce the size of the particle. But guess what else it's reducing? It's reducing the actual powerful uh, force of the curcuminoid itself because there's just not as much there. So it's like saying, well, if you could get a particle that has 100%, let's just say that, that both of them are starting out at 100%. And this particle is getting through at 100% at of its size, but this particle is only getting through at 50% of its size. You can imagine that the 100% particle is delivering more benefit than the 50% particle. And that's what that's really what's happening is that that we're that that coating is actually allowing it to to squeeze through the exit in a way that particles that don't have the coating can't. And before we actually put the curcumin through the coating, uh, we look for the highest level of bioavailable uh, curcumin. So you could take turmeric, which uh, is the start of curcumin. Um, and it doesn't have, you, you can't have as many curcuminoids that you get from curcumin. And then there's regular curcumin and you can, it's only so bioavailable. Um, because of the, the size of the molecules, but then we take it one step further, further, and we use tetrahydrocurcumin. So we note it's not even just readily bioavailable because of the process that it goes through, but we start with a very high level of the ingredient that we go through the Silock and Dexki process. So um, the tetrahydrocurcumin that we use is extremely bioavailable. 
but then we go through another process to make it even more bioavailable. So that's why it works so well. Yeah, that's a really, a really key point. Um, then finally, uh, Kurt, where is the curcumin source sourced from? Uh, well, there's a reason that, that um, Angie and Shane moved out to the country. We, we grow it on their farm. Uh, no, um, we, we actually source it primarily from Sabinsa. Uh, and, and you can look up Sabinsa. Uh, Sabinsa is a very large international raw ingredient company. And, um, and, and, and in fact, tetrahydrocurcumin is specific to Sabinsa. They developed it. And uh, that's where, that's where the, our, this curcuminoid is sourced from, is specifically from Sabinsa. Hey guys, I love your energy. Thank you so much. I have one quick question about Optimum. Again, curcumin, uh, tetrahydrocurcumin with veterinary. Um, I've been using it on one of my cats and I was talking to my vet and they're really interested in using it on dogs and horses. And uh, of course I've seen uh, the chibi testimonial, which is amazing. And I'm just wondering, um, my vet uh, was asking, well, what kinds of, they're, they're not, familiar with curcumin apparently as an anti-inflammatory for use in veterinary. So are we talking about like, uh, well, I guess, I guess what I told him was, you know, why don't you, what I'd love you to do is start to pick out cases where you just don't know what else to do and then start giving him this to see. But I thought maybe you guys would have a better place to start for a vet. Well, I can tell you that, um, you know, animals age at a faster rate than we do, right? Largely. Um, not all of them, actually. That's not true. I mean, I don't think whales do. I don't think sea, I don't think <laughs> like tortoises do, but for the most part, animals do. And what do we know is the primary component of aging? Oxidative stress. Okay, so oxidative stress, both in animals and in humans, okay? In fact, Dr. McCord has proven that oxidative stress affects every oxygen-breathing entity you know, a uh, thing on earth, okay? So, um, and so if you can reduce that oxidative stress in animals, you're reducing the same, the same component that's um, primary driver in aging in us and them, as well as all the diseases. We all know that the animals are subject to largely the many, many of the same diseases, you know, cancers and, and, and um, diabetes and all types of things that they have, joint difficulties. And so, um, they're, at, at Life Vantage, they're actually, you know, we actually developed a pro tandem for animals uh, product that that uh, with Dr. McCord and and was and boy, we have thou probably thousands of testimonials. I'm guessing Angie from um, from everybody from horses, you know, trainers of of, of thoroughbreds and and horse races, horse um, racing horses, to dogs and and cats and things like that. Um, now the same thing's true of turmeric. Turmeric has um, a, a benefit for animals. And in fact, if you Google, you know, turmeric or curcumin and animals, you'll find that there actually are products specifically directed towards um, the veterinary population um, and, and, and animals. Ours haven't been formulated specifically for that, but I like your idea, Gil. Um, there's, there's not a toxicity issue there. I know that. Mm -hmm. And so they can, they can take that. Um, and, and so um, if he's willing to try, would you actually, I would even be willing to participate in maybe um, if they want to do some kind of casual study and, and within, and we'll provide them some product and they can see how it works. I think they'd love that. Fantastic. Okay. And, cool. and what, what I can say is uh, as when it comes to turmeric and or curcumin, uh, I have horses and, and I uh, am very diligent about uh, supplementing my horses. So uh, the, the turmeric and curcumin is becoming a lot more po popular in the equine world. So with horses, um, and it's starting to become one of these specialty ingredients that they look for reducing inflammation. And, and they found that uh, turmeric or, or curcumin uh, works better than um, MSM, MSM? Um, and also glucosamine. So in the in the horse world, uh, people would really look at glucosamine and MSM products uh, for their joints, especially with performance horses. Uh, when you when you're looking at a performance horses, or if you have a performance horse, um, the things that you look for is you want to protect their gut, their their joints, and their feet. Uh, because if you don't have feet, joints, or, or a good gut, you're not going to have a good performance horse. So when it comes to uh, uh, curcumin and turmeric, it's actually becoming a more popular ingredient um, that they are starting to introduce into supplements. Um, 
same thing with horses and other animals as with humans, the molecule of the curcumin and turmeric is too large to really be absorbed. So that's why, um, in my opinion, it hasn't been as popular in the um, animal supplements as it has been um, with like the the human supplements. Um, if you think about like how much turmeric and curcumin you would have to consume if it wasn't in Optimum, um, you would be having to consume a lot of, of, of turmeric. And so uh, if you're giving it to a horse or a dog, they're not gonna consume that that much because you're not gonna be able to get it into them in, in that amount. So for me, I think Optimum is a, a great solution um, for animals. Uh, because it does it, make it so that it can get into that bloodstream just like it does for us. Um, I know that when my, my dog jumped out of my truck and he hurt his ankle, he sprained his ankle, I immediately gave him Optimum and within 20 minutes he was running around again, uh, which was not a good thing because he needed to be quiet once he uh, uh, sprained his ankle, but he was feeling so good that he re just really wanted to run around again. But, um, and you guys have all seen Chibi, there's a lot of different uh, people that have had great testimonials with Optimum and usually it's with their dogs because uh, it's easier to get a dog to take um, powder or a pill than it is a cat. So um, Gil, I'm, I'm very impressed that you get your cat to take Optimum. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, and I, so that, that's a little bit of background with um, animals and turmeric and curcumin. How much you gave a horse? Because I had a person, usually, but we didn't know how much you can give her a horse. So, uh, and with a horse, uh, they would have a benefit with just taking one pill um, morning and night, just like humans. It, it's amazing that even though uh, a horse is so large, um, they don't necessarily need, so if a horse is a thousand pounds, they don't need to take um, 10 times more of a product to get the same benefits as a human would. So. Uh, they can get benefit with just one pill morning and night, uh, but it, you know if they're a performance animal, they definitely should be probably taking more so that they get uh, even more benefit from the product. Uh, I would say if they could take anywhere from like five to 12 pills a day. And actually that's interesting because that's, that's something that Dr. McCord um, went at great lengths in a, in a very complicated equation that none of us really understood. But he did say back in the day when we were talking about Portandum and horses and other animals that it wasn't based upon weight. Um, it was based more actually upon surface area of the body, and, uh, which, was, which is interesting. And, uh, and he, he showed that, that, that a horse really wouldn't require much more than a human would. So I think that to, uh, we'll, we'll let everybody go, but to close our meeting tonight, that we've learned one lesson here tonight. Yeah, we learned about GMPs and quality and efficacy, but the best thing we learned is to treat ourselves and the ones we love like a horse. Take care of your gut, take care of your joints, and take care of your feet. And probably you'll be taking care of your brain along the way. So, uh, hey, we're, we're glad that all of you joined us tonight. Have a great weekend. And, um, and we'll talk to you all again next week. Thanks, Thank Angie. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.